So now we're ready to put together the facts that the GCD is a linear combination to prove two cool results, one fun and the other important and, and serious. So let's begin with the diehard example. So we looked at the diehard state machine and we figured out uh, the behavior of it with uh, jugs of size three and five gallons and also with jugs of size three and six gallons. Let's look at the general case now. Suppose that I have jugs of uh, A gallons and B gallons, where A and B are positive integers. Um, now, when we looked at the state machine, we figured out that under the diehard rules, the number of gallons in each bucket at any stage is a linear combination of the bucket sizes. So at any point that uh, in after a, uh, any sequence of moves of diehard moves, um, in each bucket there will be a linear combination of A and B. Now the point is that linear combinations of A and B are the same as multiples of the GCD. The reason is that um, uh, the GCD is a divisor of A and B, of course, it's a common divisor, and therefore it divides any linear combination of A and B. So any linear combination of A and B is a multiple of the GCD, uh, and the GCD is itself a linear combination. So linear combinations of A and B are the same as multiples of GCD. So that gives us a pretty good understanding of what the amounts that we can get in the various buckets are. Um, we can only get multiples of GCDs, but in fact, you can get any multiple of the GCD of A and B into a bucket, providing it'll fit in the bucket. That's the same as saying that you can get any linear combination amount of A and B into a bucket if there's room for it in the bucket. So let's see how to do that. So suppose that I have a linear combination of A and B, SA plus TB, that will fit in bucket B, meaning it's greater than or equal to zero and it's less than B. So it's, an, it's a number of gallons that could fit into bucket B. How do I get that amount into bucket B? And here's how. Um, we can assume that S is positive. We've already seen uh, that we can arrange that to be the case. And so what I want, what we're going to do is repeat the following procedure S times. I'm going to fill up bucket A and pour it into bucket B. Whenever B gets full, fill, filled up, I'll just dump it so that it's empty and I can keep uh, filling up bucket A uh, and pouring it into bucket B and I repeat that S times. Now when I do that, the total number of times that I've filled bucket uh, uh, A is S times, so the total amount of water that I have uh, taken from the faucet or from the fountain is S times A. and uh, I've poured it into B and then dumped it, leaving only some amount that's in B that's less than B. So the amount that's left after pouring in SA gallons uh, and uh, dumping out what won't fit, I'm left with some amount that's non-negative and less than B in bucket B. Okay. Now, the point is that the number of emptyings of bucket B must be exactly t, which is why the amount of, of water that's left in bucket B is SA minus TB. And the reason why it has to be minus T is that um, if uh, I've got SA there, if I had uh, more than T emptyings, I would have had bucket B go negative. There just isn't enough room for it. And if I had fewer than T, uh, emptyings, then the bucket would have an amount larger than B in it. So the only possible uh, number of emptyings of B is minus T. Remember, T is negative, so minus T is a positive number. And that means that I've put in SA and taken out TB, and I'm left with exactly the linear combination SA minus TB. So in fact, there's no need to count because uh, you don't need to need, need to know what S A and T uh, what S and T are because you can just knowing that you can get any desired amount that's a that's a multiple of the GCD into bucket B, 
you just keep doing this process until you get the amount that you want. So you fill bucket A, you pour it into B, when B fills, you empty it. You just keep track of how much, how many gallons there are in bucket B, and you keep going until you get the amount that you want, and then you're done. Okay, so much for that application. So now we come to the uh, serious theorem, um, the prime factorization theorem. So let's begin by uh, looking at a technical property of uh, primes, which is familiar, but uh, we're going to need to prove it. If you believe in prime factorization, then this lemma, which says that if P divides a product, it divides one or the other of the components of the product, that's an immediate consequence of the prime factorization theorem. But we mustn't prove it that way because we're trying to use this to prove prime factorization. So how can I prove, based on the facts of the, what we know about GCDs, uh, without appealing to prime factorization, that if P is a prime and P divides a product, then it, uh, then it divides one of the uh, components of the product, either the multiplier or the multiplicand. Okay, well, here's how to prove that. Suppose that P divides AB, but it doesn't divide A. Of course, if it does divide A, I'm done. So we may as well assume that it doesn't divide A. Now that means that since the only divisors of, the only divisors of P are P and 1, the only positive divisors of P are P and 1, that if P doesn't divide A, the GCD of A and P is 1. All right, now comes the linear combination trick. Given that the GCD of P and A is 1, that means that I have a linear combination of A and P that's equal to 1. SA plus TP is equal to 1 for some coefficients S and T. Cool. Multiply everything by B on the right. So that means that SAB plus TPB is equal to 1 times B. But look at what we have now. The first term on the left is something times AB and P divides AB, so that first term is divisible by P. The second term explicitly has a P in it, so it's certainly divisible by P. So the left-hand side is a linear combination of multiples of P, and therefore uh, itself is a multiple of P, which means the right-hand side is a multiple of P, and the right-hand side is B. So sure enough, P divides B. We're done. Um, the very elegant little proof that follows immediately from the fact that you can express the GCD of two numbers as a linear combination of those numbers. Now this is the key technical lemma that we need to prove unique uh, factorization. Um, a corollary of this that I'm actually going to need is that if P divides a product of more than two things, if P divides a product of a lot of things, it has to divide at least one of them. Um, and this you could prove by induction, with the base case being that it works for m equals 2, uh, but it's not very interesting, and we're going to take that for granted. If p divides a product of any size, it divides one of the components of the product. All right, now we're ready to prove what's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that every integer greater than 1 factors uniquely into a weakly decreasing sequence of primes. Now. The statement of weakly decreasing is a little bit technical and unexpected. What we want to say is that, that, it, that a number factors into the same set of primes. Well, that's not quite right because the set of primes doesn't take into account how many times each prime occurs. Um, you could try to make a statement about every number uniquely is a multiple of, of a certain number of each kind of prime. but. A slick way to do that is simply to say, take all the prime factors, including multiple occurrences of a prime, and line them up in weakly decreasing order. And when you do that, that sequence is unique. Okay? Um, this uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic is also called the prime factorization theorem. And uh, here's what it says when we spell it out uh, without using the words weakly, uh, uh, weakly increasing or weakly decreasing, um, it says that every integer n greater than 1 has a unique factorization into primes. Mainly it can be namely, it can be expressed as a product of p1 through pk um, is equal to n. 
um, with P1 greater than or equal to P2 greater than or equal to each successive prime in the sequence with the smallest one last. Okay. Um, let's do an example. So uh, there's a number that was not chosen by accident because I worked out what the factorization was, and it factors into the following weekly decreasing sequence. You start with the prime 53, you follow by three occurrences of 37, two 11s, a 7, and three threes. And the point is that if you try to express this ugly number as a weekly decreasing sequence of primes, you're always going to get exactly this sequence. It's the only way to do it. All right, how are we going to prove that? Well, um, let's suppose that it wasn't true. Suppose that there was some number that could be factored in two different ways. Well, by the well-ordering principle, there's a least one. So we're talking about numbers that are greater than one, so there's a least number greater than one that can be factored in two different ways. Suppose that it's n. So what I have is that n is a product p1 through pk, and it's equal to another product, q1 through qm, where the p's and the q's are all prime. And these two weakly decreasing sequences are not the same. They differ somehow. OK. Uh, so the, the, we can assume that the p's are listed in a weakly decreasing order, and the q's are likewise in, uh, listed in weakly decreasing order. Now, the first observation is suppose that q1 is equal to p1. Well, that's not really possible, because if q1 is equal to p1, then I could cancel the p1 from both sides, and I would get that p2 through pk uh, is equal to q2 through qm, and these would still be different since I, they were different and I took the same thing from their beginning. I'm left with a smaller number that does not have a unique factorization, contradicting the minimality of n. So in short, um, uh, it's not possible for uh, q1 to equal p1, so one of them has to be greater. We may as well assume that q1 is bigger than p1. OK, so q1 is bigger than p1, and p1 is greater than or equal to all the other p's. So in fact, q1 is bigger than every one of the p's. Well, that's going to reach a contradiction because of the, co of the corollary. What I know is that q1 divides n, and n is the product of the p's. And since q divides the product of the p's by the corollary, it's got to divide one of them. q1 must divide pi for some i. But that contradicts the fact that QI, q1 is bigger than pi. That's not possible for the smaller number to divide. The, the larger number to divide the smaller number. And uh, we're done. And we have proved the unique factorization theorem.